بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم فاروق حسن از بیک ود اے برانڈ نیو ایپیسوڈ آف اسکائی از دا لمٹ ویورز آئی ایم ہیئر ایٹ دا پرائم منسٹرس آفس ٹوڈے اینڈ آئی ایم ویری پریولیج ٹو کم ہیئر اینڈ انٹروڈیوس ٹو یو دا یوتھ آئیکون آف پاکستان دا پرسن ہوز ہیڈنگ دا پرائم منسٹر یوتھ پروگرام دا اسپیشل اسسٹنٹ ٹو پرائم منسٹر آن یوتھ افیئرس محترمہ شزا فاطمہ خواجہ لیٹس گو اینڈ میٹ Assalamu alaikum Shaza thank you very much for giving us time it's a real honor to be here with you uh, as i told you viewers Shaza Fatma Khaja is uh, an MNA member national assembly parliamentarian and uh, she is the special assistant to prime minister on youth affairs prime minister youth program and above all she is an icon who is representing 68% of the population of pakistan this is a big big responsibility on her shoulders so let's let's talk to shaza let's get to know her better shaza you hail from sialkot and that was news to me i didn't know that i always thought you're from lahore so tell us uh, about your early childhood you know like uh, where did you go to school and um, you know so how did it all start bismillah rahman rahim uh, first of all thank you for having me uh, on your show Uh, so yeah so my parents my grandparents uh, they all uh, come from sialkot uh, and we still have family there uh, we visit uh, very regularly uh, i was uh, born interestingly enough in mari and okay. my father was posted there at that time he was uh, ac mari and uh, that is where i was born and then i spent uh, the very very early years uh, of the first one and a half year in faisalabad where he was then posted oh, okay and uh, but then he was posted as uh, dc saiwal so that is where i began my schooling okay so my first school uh, was uh, nursery and kindergarten was convent uh, saiwal so you've been all to the uh, cities yeah. of pakistan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we uh, yeah lived there lived there uh, so then uh, 1992 i think we moved to lahore and that is where then stuck with the uh, lahore and that is where i did my schooling my college university uh, so yeah so basically i've grown up in lahore studied in lahore okay and that is where i've uh, been since okay and so were you a naughty kid uh, or, or, or active in sports i was <laughs> i was apparently according to my mother i was quite a cry baby okay and uh, but things uh, so i still remember in uh, nursery when i used to go to school Uh, for the longest time almost 6 months uh, someone would accompany me <laughs> in the class <laughs> because uh, i would otherwise throw a tantrum and okay, uh, i need company and i need someone i know someone i know uh, so that is where it started but it i think changed quite drastically uh, down the line and uh, when we came to lahore uh, beacon house was where i uh, started my uh, you know uh, education uh, continued my education in lahore and yeah, i was quite a but you are bright so Qu- quite a, a naughty kid uh, i was bright but i was uh, also not yet at the same time at the, yeah at the same and a lot of quite a problem for my uh, teachers social uh, a lot of friends a lot of sports a lot of going out with friends uh, so yeah quite a, i've had quite a ball. good youth quite a ball when uh, i was young <laughs> so so what about which sport were you the best in like where did you excel so uh, you know i started playing table tennis was i was when i was in the secondary school um, and badminton as well uh, we used to play uh, throw ball uh, there we used to be play netball basketball it was an all girls school where we quite concentrated uh, on uh, uh, sporting activities i was mm-hmm. in beacon house uh, liberty campus a big campus unlike the new schools that keep popping up around the corner uh, now uh, so they had a good ground you know a playing field so uh, we, we, i was quite active there then i went for my a levels i went to uh, lgs and i was a sports captain there for two years oh wow yeah so i was uh, so I w- i've been a council member throughout actually so uh, my first uh, sash that i got as a council member was, was in grade 2 and uh, since then i've been part of the student council so student teachers politics. pet uh it, to some extent yes but i was quite naughty as well okay. so <laughs> it would really They depend on the teacher the check. <laughs> yeah so for example my islamia teacher in o levels mm. uh, you know i would also bunk classes for 
sports, not a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> icon over here. Uh, but she would always say that, you know, Shaza, you bunk so many classes, you will get a D in your O levels. Mm. And you know what D stands for? It stands for donkey. And <laughs> that, that is what my Islamia teacher would tell me every week. And you remember and, that. And oh, yeah, obviously, I will forever remember this. Uh, so then, but we also had, uh, you know, teachers who were really supportive. But because they, at the end of the day, I did complete my work. Yeah. Uh, and I managed to get straight A's mm -hmm. and I went up to her and I said I got an A in Islamia so thanks to you but uh, you know uh, if so you wouldn't have encouraged me I wouldn't have absolutely gotten it. absolutely I think I, my teachers have a lot of role to play uh, in, your grooming. In, in, in my grooming in where I uh, stand right now as well so you, you, uh, you're part of uh, that uh, lot of uh, young parliamentarians and especially females we've seen uh, you know over the last decade in the yeah. uh, parliament any of the parliamentarians was with you in the school uh, any of the so people I, we know i i was very young when i joined i was 25 uh, okay. when i started off with the parliament uh, yeah. and i was the youngest member oh okay uh, very few of my colleagues were my age oh, uh, okay. most of them were at least 4 to 5 years uh, elder to at least at least so 4 to 5 years okay. elder to uh, where i was Okay. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, quite a cultural uh, shift uh, as well when I joined politics. Yeah. So uh, we will come to that later. So yeah. O levels you finished and then? Yeah. Happened? So then um, uh, A levels, A levels. Then I got into Lums. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Lums was uh, I actually intended to become a doctor. So I had like physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics in my A levels. You wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. But then when I started taking uh, those classes uh, for the MCAT exam that is uh, there in Pakistan. You said it's not for you. I realized that it was absolutely not for me. Okay. So that is where I shifted tracks and I went to Lums. Um, I was there for four years. And you took politics uh, so also as a subject? Yeah, so my major was politics and economics. Uh, How come? Uh, like, do you have a political background or like? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So we've uh, grown up in political, uh, in a political family, uh, okay. starting from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, really grown up to see politics, uh, a lot very of closely. institutional memory, very closely, uh, which is sometimes not a very good thing. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, very closely. So uh, every elections, uh, we're back in Seattle court for months and months campaigning uh, for elections, uh, a lot of party work. So your grandfather uh, was in politics? My grandfather was in politics, my uncle is in politics. Uh, so we've really uh, grown up uh, and I think that institutional memory, uh, that learning, uh, you know, having gone through the process uh, really also helps uh, when I work now. So you have it so, in your blood, basically. Yeah, so yeah, that too, and that also gives you a lot of learning. Mm. Uh, so you know, uh, it, you learn so much. Um, my father was in civil service. Uh, my maternal family was in politics. So a lot of public service, uh, you know, behind there, uh, and uh, every day dinner dinner table conversations revolve around politics and politicians. So you know, it not only generates uh, an interest, but it also gives you a lot of ability to work better. Uh, when you come in the field. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, th that Obviously is... Obviously, you have uh, an edge. Absolutely. And uh, thankfully, so my parents uh, have always been very supportive uh, from a very young age. Uh, I have uh, two siblings. Both of them are my brothers. They're much older to me. One is nine years older, one is seven years older. And none in politics. Uh, no, no one in politics. <laughs> so, they were, uh, you know, also kind of like parents. Uh, but I was grown, uh, despite the fact that uh, I was brought up in a very, very pampered environment, being the only girl uh, in the family and the youngest of them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm uh, very proud of the fact that my family was able to give me that confidence, that independence to move independently, to work independently. Uh, you know, I would uh, be allowed to, I've traveled almost you know, quite a few Yeah, I was reading uh, your profile. Countries. You've been to yeah. with so the I've parliamentarians also. Absolutely. I've traveled alone. The first time I traveled alone was back in 1999. I was 11 years old and I traveled with, uh, with, with family friends. So that's when I traveled alone for the first time. We went to, we went abroad to England. Uh, so, you know, uh, that kind of encouragement, support has always been there from my family and they've ensured that I am able to manage whatever situation I'm put in. Uh, so that coupled with you know, fortunately, good. Uh, I've been education. very, very fortunate, uh, God willing, uh, that uh, with education, uh, with the institutional, uh, you know, it uh, becomes an excellent that I have. Com combo. So, kind of, you know, everything really, uh, kind of universe, you know, 
it came together. Conspired, conspired, conspired and yeah. came together. Yeah. Uh, to so lums yeah. you sailed through. You had politics and you had finance yeah. also. Yeah, economics. Yeah. Economics, yeah. Yeah. So and then you decided to go abroad, is it? Yeah, but even in lums, I was, uh, you know, I contested elections. Uh, uh, the student, student body. Yeah, student body elections, and I was uh, in uh, that elected council as well. Oh, okay. Uh, then we were part of uh, those. Uh, at that time, we had, uh, you know, protests for judiciary going on. So we led those uh, protests as well uh, during. Uh, our lums time. Mm. So that was also quite a politically active uh, time uh, of my life and uh, there uh, you were asking about sports there I was a member of 11 uh, sports uh, teams of, of lums oh. itself. So you know uh, I really uh, lived that time as well uh, in every aspect. Uh, and yeah there on as soon as I graduated uh, I went to Warwick uh, England for my masters and I did my masters in international relations and global politics from there. Okay and, and then you came uh, back? I came back, I came back and, and uh, I had always had a desire to uh, go back to my alma mater which was Lums. Okay, So you I started teaching? Yeah, so I went straight back uh, to my one of my uh, professors who was uh, Dr. Rasul Baksh uh, and Dr. Vaseem was there. Uh, uh, other faculty members. So for the first semester I TA'd, uh, I was a teacher assistant for Dr. Rasul Vakshrais and there on uh, I got an opportunity to start teaching on my own. So politics was not your first love, you, know, you, you wanted to teach, is it? I wanted to teach, yes, that was definitely, I wanted to be back. Uh, actually LUMS gives you that kind of environment where you never want to leave. Uh, leave the academics. Leave, yeah. So uh, then who pushed you into politics? Yeah. Who forced you to come into politics? So it comes 2013 and I'm teaching at LAMS and uh, a general election happens and we're back in Salcourt uh, canvassing and uh, campaigning. And uh, Punjab, uh, PMLN sweeps Punjab. Yes. And uh, actually Pakistan, but Punjab we get a lot of seats. And yeah. the reserve seats work in a way that uh, the, the number of general seats that you have, that is the proportion of reserve seats that you also get. So uh, we got about uh, 31 out of 35 reserve seats and the initial uh, list that was sent uh, to the election commission was of 20 uh, names. So there was, uh, you know, uh, the election commission wrote to the party to give 11 new uh, names ah. and uh, uh, this is where, uh, you know, the party really hunted for people who had, uh, you know, who were educated, uh, who were had a strong affiliation with the party as well. Who so had done for work party. for the party. And yeah, so uh, so that is where uh, my name was uh, put in. So this so was, it was after, by default. It was after 2013 election, yeah, so uh, yeah. happened. And you wanted to also? Or yes, yes, of or course. Or it was like one of those family decisions that, okay. No, okay. no, 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 no. I was, I was quite there uh, and uh, it was a considered, uh, you know, uh, decision, decision uh, that, uh, that happened at that time. Okay. And that is how I joined politics. So okay. June 2013, it will be a decade now, uh, wow. very soon. And so you are a seasoned yeah, I mean, parliamentarian now and obviously you yeah. would wish to continue, you are <laughs> yeah. doing a lot of work. Uh, yeah, work. so it's been 10 years great, in the parliament great. now. Any, any uh, unforgettable incident in politics that you have encountered till now? Many, many. We have, uh, you know, we jo I joined in 2013 and comes 2014 and uh, we have these sit-ins outside the National Assembly. Mm. And these sit-ins are happening and it's, you know, where he's sneaking in and sneaking out of the parliament, there is a threat of being attacked uh, by the protesters. So, you know, that is where it started and then uh, came all the, you know, the, the almost now 10 years of uh, political uh, targeting of uh, our leadership. So we had been in courts every other day and eventually ended up in jails every other day. Uh, I have spent quite a few, uh, you know, you would say Eids and birthdays um, outside courts or prisons uh, as luck would have it. Uh, one incident that I think will really stick with me is that uh, it is uh, Madam Mariam Nawaz's uh, NAB hearing. Yeah. And we're outside uh, NAB headquarters in Lahore and uh, there's a protest going on. And uh, I'm sitting on top of uh, this double cabin uh, car yeah. and uh, on the roof actually with a few colleagues. And uh, all of a sudden we see that the police opens uh, the water cannons. water cannon yeah yeah so the water cannons are open to disperse the to crowd, disperse the crowd. Yeah. and uh, there is a complete stampede all across yeah and follow uh, uh, the water cannons are then followed by stone pelting and brick pelting by the police so there's mayhem and all there's over. lati charge and there's mayhem and there's chaos 
and we are sitting on top of uh, this car, car and a brick comes and it hits the car and it breaks the windshield. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's this big and eventually I like, I have a picture with that brick in my hand as well. Mm. Um, and the store, and that is where I think the driver realizes that we really need to move. Mm. So he just starts moving the car with us on top. And the car is now going full speed on uh, this, you know, on, on a and main on top road, of it. and we're on top of it. There's My nothing God. to hold, and we're sitting on top of it. Uh, the mayor Lahore was sitting behind me. Broke his leg. Somebody hit a brick on his leg. Uh, fractured yeah. his leg. Uh, so people are getting injured all over, and we're going full, literally full speed. And uh, I see a policeman charging towards us, mm. even even on on the moving car. Mm. And they're like, you know, hitting the car. They were so close that they're hitting the, the car with sticks. Yeah. And uh, then comes a cylinder, you know those uh, uh, tear, gas? The tear gas cylinders, yeah. and they throw Shell. it the, the shells, yeah. So they throw it from such proximity that it hits me in the leg. I still have a mark, burn mark. It burns my leg. Yeah. It burns my colleague's arm, and it's a moving car and absolute chaos. And that is, I think, one memory that will that really, really... That night you would really, have remembered. Yeah, sure. that, 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 that is something that I think will really stick, stick with me. Right. I also have a vi someone making a video from quite a distance. Yeah. And uh, so you have that, that video incident, incident on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is uh, quite a memory I that I will have. I wish we have less of those uh, <laughs> events in uh, yeah. politics. But I think it's a part of the game. And this is how uh, uh, it, yeah. uh, it, uh, it's part of the struggle that we have uh, here at least in, uh, in Pakistan. Why did Prime Minister Mohammad Shahbaz Sharif Saab pick you to be the SAPM for PMYP? So last four years have been quite tough on all of us. Uh, the political victimization was at its peak. Uh, all of our leadership was incarcerated. Uh, literally the first two rows in the National Assembly, which, which used to be the ex-federal cabinet, they were all uh, sent to prisons. Uh, and I would like to uh, put in here that not even a single penny of corruption was eventually proven against them. All of them had to be released. Uh, despite the fact uh, that the previous government had four years of all the departments, anti-corruption, FIA, NAB, everything at their behest, all intelligence, all uh, ministries with all paperwork, audit reports, uh, not even a single penny of corruption uh, was proven against any, any member of our party. Uh, but despite that, all of them uh, were incarcerated at some point in time. And uh, we really struggled a lot. And uh, I think that that is where uh, opposition was also a time where I got to learn a lot. Uh, I started working with uh, the now Prime Minister Shabazz Saab uh, in the election 2018. Mm -hmm. And I was in his election set. Okay. So managing the whole election, distributing tickets, uh, the I was Secretary for the all Parliamentary the Board as well. So all the paperwork uh, was with me. So that is where we started. Uh, I started working with him, and that is where he asked me to also stop teaching at Lums as well, because working with him is a 24-hour thing. So 2018, mm. I stopped He's teaching. He's a demanding at Lums. boss. Quite a demanding. <laughs> boss. Uh, he sleeps at 11, wakes up at 3 a.m. Uh, so you can, uh, yeah. you know, understand uh, where he comes from. So uh, that's where I also stopped teaching at Lums after six mm. years in 2018. So you developed a repo with the uh, yeah, Mama and Shabazz then uh, the last four years, uh, you know, uh, we've had to deal with a lot. A lot of legislation, the FATF legislations, the NAB legislations, um, a lot of, you know, working on the budget, preparing speeches. I'm the uh, Secretary for Parliamentary Affairs for PMLN as well. Okay. So I've been dealing with the members, ensuring attendance, so. coordinating with so. them. So it's so just trust in you that Yeah, it, I, I'd say I'm very grateful uh, and honored uh, for his confidence that he's opposed in me by putting me in this place. And uh, maybe also because I'm one of the younger members uh, that, that they have. Uh, you, the right icon for you. Yeah, one, one of the, uh, not, not that young anymore, uh, but still one of the younger members uh, that they have. Uh, I would want to believe part. that I am. <laughs> 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 Great. Um, uh, viewers, we are in conversation with uh, Mohtarma Shaza Fatma Khaja. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. It's a very interesting interview. Stay tuned. Welcome back viewers, I'm Farooq Hassan and I'm, we are in conversation with Ma'am Shaza Fatma Khaja and uh, as you all know, she is representing the 68% youth of Pakistan. So let's hear from her, what are the plans, 
vision of the government of Pakistan to tap the potential of this vast majority of youth, which is the future of Pakistan. Shaza, I'd like to ask you, we just relaunched the Prime Minister Youth Program and you were heading it, you devised it and Prime Minister Muhammad Shabazz Sharif Saab, Excellency Muhammad Shabazz Sharif Saab uh, inaugurated that. How is it going and can you tell us the salient features of uh, all the programs that so as you've already uh, spoken um, about 70 68% of Pakistan's population and this is 2017 census uh, so we're quite sure that there are a lot more now uh, is under the age of 30 yeah. and uh, that's about 150 million people yeah. and uh, even within them we have about 100 million people uh, who are under the age of 15 mm -hmm. uh, so we're kind of doubling our population every 50 uh, 15 years so um, this is a you know huge chunk of population that we're looking at and we're talking about and um, first of all I'd like to say that they're no longer the future of Pakistan uh, the sheer numbers tell us that they are the present of Pakistan they are the uh, they are, they are they're now here. the present of Pakistan okay. and they're here they're, they're very much here yeah. uh, and uh, again the sheer numbers also tell us that until and unless we channelize their abilities their energies uh, towards positive uh, you know activities um, yeah. so that they become actually they become the assets that they're supposed to be for this country. Constructive and positive. Yeah, constructive, positive, uh, you know, in mainstream economy, whether it's sports, but you know, all those activities that contribute to the development of the country. Uh, until and unless we're effectively able to channelize them, uh, they, this number can also pose to be a challenge for Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, the limited resources that we have, whether it's social resources in terms of education, health, uh, you know, job opportunities, uh, it, it, it can be a huge resource burden. Uh, so this is basically the essence of the youth program as well. Yeah. And uh, about 10 years back in 2013, uh, when Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, Zahab took over the federal government, and even before that, uh, you know, in 2008, when Shabash Sharif Sahab uh, took uh, over the Punjab government, yeah. these youth programs are running since then. Yeah. Uh, so Punjab uh, took was you know ahead of the curve. And uh, they uh, basically started uh, quite a lot of programs, inclu including the Punjab Education Endowment Fund, uh, the E-Rosgar, the e-learning uh, the laptop program, was the most the famous laptops, one. The laptops, absolutely. It made news uh, everywhere. Absolutely. So the, that was the kind of the flagship program. So the laptop program, and then, then there were internship, uh, oh, sorry, entrepreneurship loans. They were paid internships. So this is uh, where we took off uh, with the youth program in Punjab. And then as soon as we had the federal government, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif then carried on uh, with that and initiated all of those programs across Pakistan as the Prime Minister's Youth Program. And uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, similar initiatives in that. We had Karze Hasna, which was an interest-free loan uh, program, uh, but this was a very targeted uh, loan and it was targeted for uh, young people coming from underdeveloped areas of Pakistan. So it was a focused uh, It is a very focused and targeted uh, interest-free loan. And uh, similarly, the scholarship program was also targeted for uh, young people coming from underdeveloped areas of Pakistan. So what uh, you're saying is that the first time that this started was in 2013. Yeah. And ever in yeah. the history of Pakistan yeah. for the youth for, specifically. For youth, a specific and youth it emanated from Punjab. Yeah. Mr. Muhammad Shahbaz Sharif, who was yeah. then the chief minister. Absolutely. And then it was replicated in the federal, uh, yeah. you know, by the government yeah. of Pakistan uh, under uh, Pre Pre uh, Prime Minister Muhammad Nawaz Shah yeah. Sharif Saab. Okay. Okay. So this is how uh, you know it actually started, and uh, it was. Uh, I would also like to uh, add here that it was actually the brainchild of Mariam Nawashri Saiba, and uh, she initiated it. And uh, uh, you know, it was her brainchild in the fed uh, federal uh, uh, government, uh, where she then chaired it uh, for some time. The uniqueness of this program was uh, that this program uh, and this office never held any budgets directly. Okay. So we were never we were never dealing with the financial matters directly. So you were dependent on we, other we, ministries. We strategize. Okay. We strategize. We coordinate. Uh, we give prime ministers vision uh, to relevant ministries. And you know, youth is a, quite a cross-cutting subject. Yeah. So uh, we had to ensure that all the ministries were working. Uh, if they were synergized. Uh, in terms of their efforts. So we work with education ministry, the IT ministry, the planning ministry, sports, environment, culture. IPC, sports, heritage. So all of this ha has something to do with young people. We used to have a youth ministry also, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but that was before uh, the youth was devolved as a subject. Yeah. And that is why Prime Minister had to take a special initiative 
uh, to ensure that there was an office for young people within the Prime Minister's office. And this is how uh, the journey began. And this year we celebrate Prime Minister Youth Program's 10th anniversary oh, wow. in 2023. So it's been a decade of uh, this program. And it's uh, one of the only programs that actually, you know, passed the test of changing governments. It was uh, converted into Kamyab Jawan uh, program uh, during the previous regime. And uh, they, you know, they, they removed some of the programs uh, and continued uh, with others. And uh, but the thing is that uh, that kind of tells you uh, the prominence, the importance of this program and how well this program was strategized. Uh, that it's inevitable that anyone who comes in will have to continue. Yeah. So that first seed that was sown uh, back in 2013 was so strong uh, that despite changing policies in every other matter, we saw that the youth program had to be continued. But this is a reality. It is like a reality and now. And it's here, as Absolutely. you mentioned. So. Absolutely. Yeah. They're all here. Uh, so yeah, so th that program had a certain initiative and now uh, in 2023, as uh, in, under the directions of uh, PM Shabash Sharif Sahab, uh, the first program that we relaunched that was shut down for the last four years was the laptop program. And uh, th that's the first thing I think uh, he thought of when he came to office as well, uh, was to relaunch that because uh, we saw a lot of dividends during COVID. Uh, when COVID happened and pandemic happened, uh, laptops were the only source. Zoom calls uh, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Whether, whether, you know, young people were working, whether it's, it, it was education, a lot of people, uh, a lot of our young students were repatriated from foreign countries and had to take remote classes yeah. uh, in their universities abroad. Yeah. So we saw that, you know, this one single device was really off. the platform uh, that was there for them in the toughest of times. Uh, that you know, the, the mankind has seen in centuries, which was the uh, pandemic, yeah. basically. So, but have you done any tweaking to that program, or is it still the same one that was initially launched? This laptop, so the laptop the program, criteria and all. Yeah, the laptop program is the same because okay. it was a merit-based program, and uh, I would like to also mention here that uh, it was also politically targeted uh, in Punjab as well as in um, the federal, uh, you know, in the federation. And uh, it passed all tests, all uh, NAB uh, inquiries, all anti-corruption inquiries. Uh, we hardly have any complaints because, uh, you know, the portal is automated uh, in, uh, uh, and the applications are online. Mm -hmm. So the, when you upload your degrees and students upload all of their information, we get an automatically generated merit list. So it's a merit-based scrutiny. Absolutely. And me that merit list is then tallied with the manual merit, merit list that's provided by the university as well. Okay. Uh, and the university vice chancellors have to sign affidavits uh, confirming that this is the actual merit list. So that's list. a cross-check. So, and there's a cross-check as well. And there are multiple cross-checks at different levels that we've put in. And uh, as a consequence, we were able to sail through uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, tests, transparency yes. tests that came on. Uh, any complaints that were registered in the courts anywhere, uh, very minimal. So it's a very, very transparent program. There's not even a single laptop where you can say that it was given out uh, out of Out merit. of time. Okay. So we're uh, very, uh, you know, proud of uh, this program and we'll be, we'll be relaunching this. Um, and uh, the Prime Minister will hopefully start dis the distribution next month. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So it's relaunched, but the distribution will start. We'll start next month. Next. And uh, the same criteria as you just uh, mentioned. Yeah, as so this one. is one facet. So that was the one. Uh, the one. That's one of the programs. Um, we basically, I'll uh, just you know broadly tell you that we basically operate under four verticals. So we have education, employment, entrepreneur. Uh, sorry, education, employment, environment, and engagement. So these are four E's uh, that we operate under. Operate the four under. verticals. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so laptop is under the education, education uh, program. What, Another, else, what uh, else is under Yeah, education? so under education, the second uh, program that we're looking into is, uh, and we try to focus more on non-formal education. So uh, it is more about uh, skills trainings, boot camps. Vocational training. Vocational trainings, technical trainings. We have NAFTA and uh, NAFTEC NAFTEC yeah. and we have TAFTA. NAFTEC and TAFTAs. So we operate through them. Okay. But this is a subsidized program. It is a scholarship program for uh, different vocational and technical trainings. Okay. And uh, here I would also like to say that uh, whereas we are focusing right now on more on IT skills and high tech skills, uh, because A, it's the need of the hour, the global economy is really changing. Major uh, paradigm shift. The absolutely, complete paradigm shift uh, globally like we've seen. Uh, so I, if these trainings are not only most in demand and most relevant, but I think that in order to keep up with the world, uh, this is something that our young people really need to learn. So <coughs> our major focus is on these trainings, but 
here I would like to point out that you know uh, when when uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says that mehnat karne wala mera dost hai, any hard working person uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, he talks about everyone and anyone, not just people who are sitting in offices, but I feel that you know people who have vocational skills who are carpenters in our uh, country, people with janitorial services, people who are plumbers, you know painters, we have yeah. all sorts of expertise, we have welders, you know construction, civil works. So all of these, uh, the blue collar jobs that we have, uh, these are as important as any other uh, job that there might be. May not, may as much. Absolutely. You need to take pride in the start work as respectable, as dignified uh, as any other job and one of the slogans that we have uh, taken up uh, at this office is uh, dignified blue collar jobs. So you know when we talk about decent work, we talk about giving respect, giving dignity to all sorts of uh, you know working uh, professions and we really encourage everyone uh, uh, to participate in these vocational skills trainings as well. Okay and how, how uh, that was my other part that I was wanted to come to. How do you encourage them? Because I see a lot of youth, uh, you know, sometimes in barber shops, or, you know, youngsters who want to study but they can't afford it, obviously. How can we motivate these youngsters to actually grab that opportunity? Yeah, so th we have, uh, you know, problems, uh, we have some structural problems uh, yeah. with the system as well, with our culture as well. Yeah. Um, we tend to stigmatize uh, certain professions yeah. and we tend to uh, kind of give respect to other professions more. If I go in any developed country, yeah. if, I, if I, I've lived in the UK for a year, uh, a plumber comes in and uh, he or she is probably more even Highest better jobs. paid uh, <laughs> than the doctors and engineers. You can't get right? time from them. You, you know? can't get they time. They give two weeks uh, in advance. Absolutely. So you know, uh, I think this is a cultural problem that is also holding our larger development back, where we, uh, uh, where we as a society need to uh, recognize the dignity in these professions, the importance of these professions. You know, I tell you, one day the janitorial services go off in this country and we will see how we survive as a nation. But, but right? Chana, don't you so, feel that uh, they are very well paid there, where, 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 where you mentioned like Yeah, that's UK. where I was coming, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so, so that's the thing, right? So, uh, as soon as we start to remove these stigmas around these uh, professions uh, and we get more and more people to participate in formal training, so this is also very important that to, to be formally trained to get that level of expertise uh, is also very important. So yes. our people also need to realize that it is, uh, you know, it's good where they're learning through the Ustad Shagird method where, you know, informally they get this trained is what happens here. in workshops. Uh, but the more trained they get, the better levels of training that they get to, this is an investment in themselves. So this, this kind of awareness also needs to be there that the better trained they are, the more expertise they have, the better paid they will be. And that is another way of the, the, the bottom to top way of removing stigmas around these professions as well. So you know more and more people need to come in and one thing that we are doing uh, uh, to you know facilitate uh, this program in this sense is that we are getting major universities with good label names on board on technical and vocational trainings. So okay. we are taking on board uh, universities like LUMS uh, you know and IBA. NUST and IBA to come into these fields as well. Today. Oh, if you go into that's a good shift. yeah, if you go towards you know so so you know my my, my carpenter should also be able to say that I'm an IBA graduate. Uh, I've done this and this uh, level specialized of in plumbing specialized from in plumbing. IBA. You know, globally we have PhDs in welding. We have PhDs in plumbing wow. and carpenting. So why not in Pakistan and why, why, where most of our labor force actually because we are not investing in these trainings as people and also. I would take some responsibility as well in terms of being the government uh, that most of the, our labor that goes abroad then also faces these issues. They are underpaid, uh, their living standards, their social... Uh, because you know, they, don't because they don't have that qualification from that recognized university. Absolutely. Are the That's universities right. receptive on this? Absolutely. They are uh, they're, they're receptive, started? there's a lot of demand. Uh, you know, universities also operate as entities, they see a lot of demand here. And when they see demand, when they when they see the government initiative, they they're completely interested in it. So has anyone uh, started? Uh, okay. Yeah, so we started uh, th this program uh, with a couple of universities. LUM started uh, more towards uh, technical uh, trainings. Uh, a couple of other universities also participated. Uh, and but we, you know, intend to cascade this, and we 
take it forward and spread it further. So pilot programs uh, are in process, but we hope that we will take it. And I will go a take a step further back and say that uh, we're also trying to institutionalize uh, these trainings. So if you're in uh, your you know secondary uh, school, you should have that option. You know, not everyone's a genius in biology and chemistry and physics. Um, and we don't need everyone to be a genius in that uh, as well. Mathematics. Or uh, mathematics for that matter, or any subject. So th there should be an option like, again, like any other good developed country, there should be an option to take an alternate career path where these uh, this formal education needs to take a step back. That's very logical. Soft uh, education, you know, basic education skills, and then coupled with some sort of technical or vocational training. So we're trying to, you know, institutionalize that um, secondary uh, in the secondary school system as well as in the uh, you know uh, intertech and the metric tech and we're trying to introduce that so that and this also will help eventually you know the social stigma that we were talking about if my class fellow coming from the same school same university takes up that profession i will automatically you know develop a certain sense of linkage uh, yeah, with that yeah. As well. Oh, you've yeah, yeah. you studied from that you know, Yeah, oh. so you know, so 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 this and is. And it will uh, add authentication. You know, like nowadays, what we do is most of these, um, you know, skilled labor, uh, ustad shagird yeah. uh, method. You know, there's there's no authenticity. Absolutely. Where we just go from generation to generation because his father used to yeah. be yeah. Uh, doing this yeah. and he was very good, so he must be very good. Yeah. But there's no that he's qualified. We don't have a certification. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think so. This is what we're doing in education, focusing okay. more on non-formal education mm -hmm. at the moment. Great. Um, as far as the employment aspect is concerned, once again, uh, the formal employment uh, is you know more dependent on macroeconomic indicators. Uh, a certain percentage growth in GDP creates a certain number of jobs. Industry, capitalization. Uh, absolutely. So we uh, tend to focus more towards entrepreneurship and uh, for that uh, one of our largest programs that we're running is the uh, Prime Minister's Youth Business and Agriculture Loan Program. Mm -hmm. And that is to encourage entrepreneurship, to encourage young people to do better in the agriculture sector, that's the backbone of our society. That's the first time you've added it, uh, this agriculture, Yeah, so the it? agriculture bit has been added for the first time. Yeah. And we'll be giving uh, agricultural loans. Uh, and it is also, you know, I'm proud to say that it's not only for implements, it's also if you want to buy seeds, fertilizers. So for the growth, uh, you know, uh, processes as well, the loan is available. And this should actually take off because we are an agro-based uh, economy um, at the end of the day. And post floods, I think that the national food security also becomes a challenge. Yeah. And this was the need of the hour where uh, we have to support our families, our young people, especially in the flood hit areas as well, uh, in order to re rehabilitate and reestablish their lifestyles. To, you know, these are the people who grow food for us that we eat in these uh, cities as well. So to, for their rehabilitation, uh, the Prime Minister was adamant that we need to uh, really, you know, put in agriculture a bit. Uh, so we are encouraging young people to start businesses, to, uh, you, to expand their existing businesses, so micro businesses to, uh, you know, medium enterprises and medium and small enterprises, small enterprises to medium enterprises. So it's an expansionary loan, if you can start a new business with it, and this in turn, uh, will create, create employment. employment. So instead of becoming job seekers, we're encouraging our young people to take job benefit. Givers. Yeah, absolutely, and become employment providers. But is the criteria very stringent? Like if someone wants to open a barber shop and yeah. he needs a loan of let's say three million or yeah. four million, yeah, how receptive is the PMYP? So uh, the applications are completely online and they're processed by the banks. Uh, but how we help and where we come in is that up to 2.5 million the loan is completely interest free okay. it is collateral free so you don't have to give any you know formal uh, collateral or any kind of uh, any person as a guarantor as well you can just apply and get the loan uh, 0.5 to 1.5 million uh, uh, up to point, uh, 1.5 million we're looking at only 5% interest rate and this is also collateral free so at this point in time where uh, you know our uh, policy rate is up to 17%. Uh, percent. Yeah. Uh, this is quite a soft loan that we're looking at. It has a payback period of eight years. So if you divide it uh, across eight years, it is a very convenient uh, and you know easy access to capital, I would say. And up to 7.5 million is collateralized, but it's also at 7%. So anyone who's looking towards these loans, uh, I think uh, they're very easy loans, easy payback, uh, uh, you know, conditions. Uh, 
Has it's any analysis been made uh, of yeah. the loans that have been extended till now? Like what's the default or uh, yeah, infection so rate? So it started, uh, I, the first loans were disbursed in 2014. Yeah. Uh, so their payback periods are just maturing now, yeah. those eight years. Yeah. So this is the point where NPL is not performing loans and everything will come forward. But the rate is very low. Very low. Uh, that is what we know for a that's, fact. That's the fact uh, for and, uh, micro loans. Especially the tier one loan. The, uh, the you know uh, we've seen uh, and it's also been uh, you know executed by microfinance institutes and we've seen that usually the return rate of uh, the tier one loan is uh, almost 99.9 no. percent. No. So these are interest free loans and people tend to not only pay back but our people are really really you know yeah they want they, to they, they, they're good people upgrade they're good themselves at heart, yeah and no, they don't not only upgrade themselves we've seen that once they've paid back their loan they actually start donating. Uh, to the same institutes as well, and yeah. and we're talking about street vendors. We're talking about vegetable sellers. We have success stories. They, they, we have success stories, and they they're actually paying back to the community. So they, they, they we have people with big hearts, uh, I would say, and they're really really uh, you know responsible. That uh, is Pakistan that. for you. Absolutely. So uh, we have a lot of success success stories, and we're hoping that this will encourage entrepreneurship in these tough times. Uh, uh, we're looking to help our people get out of uh, you know tough situations and so, so if there's a team. genuine case and he goes to the bank and his application doesn't get approved is there any way that he's genuine he can prove his credentials and he really wants to do something can he approach the minister uh, you know your uh, youth program and uh, to assist for assistance absolutely so we have uh, complaint emails our social media platforms are open we okay. try to dispense all complaints by the end of the day okay. and uh, we, we we have uh, two to three dedicated people who are working uh, in this office, just handling and managing any complaints that come our way. Uh, okay. We don't intervene uh, in banks directly, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we do facilitate in case there is a. So that's what transparency that purposes. Absolutely. I think that's uh, ex excellent. Absolutely. So basically, under education, you've mentioned laptop and uh, vocational training. Yeah. Uh, training. Under employment, you have these agri loans and, and loans and business loans. Yeah. Right. Another initiative under uh, the employment uh, vertical is that uh, we've spoken to and I've physically uh, you know, gone across Pakistan, uh, spoken to multiple chambers, multiple associations uh, that exist and uh, we've come up with uh, the national youth employment policy that will hopefully soon be launched by the Prime Minister. So he was again very concerned about the employment levels in the country uh, and uh, that is where he gave a direction uh, to formulate a policy. Uh, right now, according to certain estimates, two to three million people enter the job market every year in Pakistan. Uh, so we've, uh, you know, uh, specified interventions that are required to ensure that this number of jobs uh, will be created, so that everyone who's entering the workforce can be absorbed uh, well in the system. Okay. So that is uh, the second thing under uh, the employment, under employment vertical that we were yeah. talking about. The environment vertical is basically Climate change is right now, you know, a global issue uh, of importance. And uh, we've done well as a country uh, in the last COP. Uh, we were leading uh, the group of 77 plus China. We were able to bring the loss and damage cause on the table, uh, agreed by all the global powers. Uh, so this is where our young people now also have to in the mainstream. And, and this is a very unique thing actually because this I think was never a part of the youth program initially yeah, yeah. and this was a subject which was not that much focused upon also Absolutely. before but now this global warming and climate change and, and I believe that Pakistan has suffered a lot because of Absolutely. this climate change and without contributing to the causes of this climate change. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we we like we emit 1% of total uh, carbon uh, you know emissions, uh, emissions uh, globally and yet we're one of the most vulnerable countries in the world the last uh, flood disaster that pakistan saw impacted 33 million people and the damage goes into some somewhere around 40 to 45 billion dollars uh, so this is quite a you know quite a devastation that we're looking at and uh, young people really have a lot to say and not only uh, do they have a lot to say uh, but it is them who will have to change and turn the things around now. Uh, we need behavioral changes, we need societal changes, we need to work on energy conservation, water conservation. Uh, so, you know, on the conservation side, there is a lot of effort that needs to be made. Uh, then we need to convert uh, towards, you know, responsible usage of fuel, 
uh, cars, we need to move towards electric vehicles, mm. we need to move towards carpooling, we need to move towards public transport. Uh, so, you know, uh, these are things uh, that are required. So, for this purpose, uh, in order to engage uh, more and more people uh, in this, uh, we uh, have made uh, the Green Youth Clubs in uh, about 137 uh, universities across Pakistan. These are public Green universities. Youth Club? Yeah. Okay. So these uh, clubs are basically... All over Pakistan, these 137 yeah, universities? Yeah, okay. all public universities uh, under the HEC. Uh, so uh, we have focal persons in every university, uh, you know, where we're engaged in their trainings, uh, we're monitoring their activities and uh, uh, I am now trying to encourage them to do more than just, I mean, it's very important to plant trees and keep your yeah. environment clean. Um, but I do feel that this is something that we used to do on, uh, in our uh, primary schools as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so on a university level, we're trying to encourage innovation. We're trying to encourage, you know, new methods. We're trying to encourage to conserve uh, green, energy. Yeah, green products. You know, we have a young uh, uh, person who's come up with uh, this filter that can that you can put in front of any tap and it will start filtering water for you and make it drinking mm. water instant uh, instantly, instant filter. absolutely uh, we have people working on uh, recycling we have people who are working on rainwater conservation so you know we need to encourage innovation we need to encourage new ideas uh, coming from universities and we need to move beyond uh, just writing research papers and converting those researches into action. actual action, into products, into policy is something that we're focusing on. I, right I must share with you, Shada, there was a Gilgit Baltistan road show just uh, think of one week back here in the National Library and there were youth from Gilgit Baltistan, students, 6th grade, 7th grade and the innovations they've yeah. come up with, I was amazed and Gilgit Baltistan is going plastic free, uh, you know, they are on that initiative and they've progressed a lot, uh, you know, like almost done with it. And so our youth have that potential, we, we need to tap it and give them the direction. Now Absolutely. what you're saying is a very specified, focused area, probably none of us at our ages thought about it. Absolutely. But now it's a possibility with all the internet available and the awareness levels, I think that's a move towards the right uh, path. So in this um, aspect, we've also launched the National Innovation Award and uh, it uh, we've opened applications first round of applications is done as we speak uh, 250 people have been shortlisted and they'll be completing their first training today uh, today yeah okay so uh, the idea is to get most applications in uh, we will shortlist 250 people who will be trained uh, to you know refine their business ideas to learn how to pitch their ideas to investors and then uh, these 250 the cohort of 250 will pitch eventually to a final jury who will shortlist 50 of them. Out of those 250 projects. Yeah. So uh, uh, those 50 will get a million uh, rupees in, uh, you know, in uh, financial, uh, as a financial reward uh, to invest in their product. Uh, they will get a million rupees worth of uh, incubation uh, through our uh, different, uh, we have Bix and Oryx and National Incubation Centers. Uh, and eventually we will ensure an investors connect where uh, we at least develop a prototype for as many ideas that we can. Uh, so we are running two rounds of this at the end of the you know uh, next six months we should have about a hundred such ideas that have been financially awarded, incubated and uh, you know. In the process we, of execution. Absolutely, it's, it's happening as we speak. Um, and uh, you know I, I believe that even if I get uh, five out of these hundreds uh, to actually commercialize and you know even be two to become unicorns at some level yeah. uh, I think it will be a great achievement uh, that will come out of this so these are just ideational uh, stage uh, you know uh, projects uh, but we are uh, you know adamant to ensure that we do their hand holding and we pull them through uh, the whole process okay. uh, and most of these uh, ideas that we've sought are uh, in sustainable development areas Fair so uh, you know water management urban management city planning well, diff awesome. different different uh, areas in the sense so that is uh, what we're doing uh, for environment we'll be holding national conferences and pre cop events as well uh, soon uh, the last one is engagement so for engagement it's uh, mainly sports and sports as you I know I was about to ask you that we yeah. are missing the most <laughs> critical part that everyone loves <laughs> absolutely so sports as you know is uh, quite a holistic field yeah. and uh, it uh, helps in the development of a person's character, leadership skills, team working, uh, you know, you learn a lot and, and they say that, you know, nations where 
uh, the, where you fill the sports field with young people, your hospitals are abandoned. So it really helps in every sense of the word. Um, we've started uh, talent, hunt, uh, talent hunts in different sports. Uh, so we've completed the hockey talent hunt. Uh, more than 12,000 people participated, young, young people participated across Pakistan. A lot of them were girls as well. Uh, now we're moving on to their regional competitions and then their national competition. What do you feel, um, you know, uh, right now obviously there are certain um, financial difficulties that our country is going through. What and 68% of the population is youth. What you are representing uh, all those youngsters uh, by being the special assistant to prime minister on youth affairs. What do you see, what, what is your vision or what is the message that you would like to give to our youth for a bright, uh, optimistic Pakistan? So my basic message would, would be to first become good human beings. And uh, I would say that we really need to go back to our cultural roots where uh, there, there was a sense of respect, there's a sense of love and affection for your young, younger ones. Um, and very basic things uh, need to be, you know, tweaked. So just, you know, stop littering around, for example, and you will see a change in the society. Uh, educate, if you're educated enough, only, only a very small percentage of our, uh, peop uh, you know, young people actually get the opportunity to get to universities. So if you're educated, maybe you want to teach another person, maybe you want to hold hand and bring other people, Mentor. help help kind of uh, people, uh, you know, that social mobility uh, that uh, we've got and we need to provide that for uh, as many people as possible to climb that social ladder, to, you know, uh, get out of their, you know, not only those in under abject po poverty, but also, you know, everyone needs that hand holding to take a step forward. So we need to really develop a culture where we pull each other up instead of, you know, uh, pulling each other's legs, essentially. So that is, I think, something which is very essential on a national level. That sense of responsibility needs to be inculcated, where we ask for rights, where we are al always, you know, protesting for our civil rights, for our basic rights. Uh, we also need to realize, as young people, our responsibilities. And those responsibilities really start from our homes, uh, where we start encouraging you know, gender is quite an issue in this country. 50% of our population is women. Most of them are left out of school, left out of workforce. Uh, start encouraging women around you. Make public places safe for everyone, for girls, for women. You know, make transport safe for everyone. We need to ensure a lot of women, for example, drop out of schools and don't go to work because they don't have safe commute. That's a, one major reason contributing uh, to holding women back. So, you know, we really need to create a society where everyone feels safe to step out of their houses, to get into public places, to play in the parks, uh, to go to shopping centers, to sit on a bus, to sit on a train. Everyone needs to feel safe. And that is the kind of society that we need to build. And until and unless we create that society, no number of governments, no governance can really uh, change the shape of the society that we're living in at this point. And I think it is every individual's effort that needs to play in. If these are young parents, they need to raise better sons. If we are uh, young, uh, you know, students, we need to be better students. We need to be, if we are young teachers, we need to be better, better teachers. teachers. We need to train our students better. You know, when we were students, uh, when our parents were students, we used to have ethics classes. They used to have, they, they, they tell us they used to have civics classes, ethics classes. We never grew up with that. But we still had teachers who were good mentors, who would tell us right from wrong. Uh, uh, today, we feel that the education system is failing us over. Commercialized. Uh, it is commercialized. It is failing us as, as human beings, it is failing us. Uh, so we really need to, you know, become first and foremost better people. And then comes the issue of we need to be educated, we need to work, we need to contribute uh, to our economy. So this is, I think, uh, uh, one single message that I would like to give to become better human beings, to ensure safety, security of everyone around you, to encourage people, to pull people up. Uh, whatever profession you're in, whatever capacity you're dealing with another human being, just be better at that. And I think that is something that is going to really turn around uh, the system overall. Great, Shaza. Uh, I think the crux that I've gotten from what you've said is that one is ownership. I think yeah. we need to own our country. We need yeah. to own whatever we are doing. We need to yeah. excel at that. 
and secondly our identity uh, we are what we are because of pakistan yeah. and uh, you know we need to make sure that we give our best to you know upbring pakistan to do that level where it is competitive amongst all the developed nations right yeah absolutely. so shada i wish you all the best and i hope and pray that you continue coming up with uh, newer initiatives you know uh, expanding this youth program pakistan 68% of the population is young youth and you know we need to focus all our strategies all our plans all our goals around that absolutely. and you are leading that initiative so lot of responsibility on your shoulders exactly. i wish you got speed thank you so thank much thank you very much for your time thank it was you. uh, really uh, very nice uh, you know having a chat with you viewers with this we come to the end of this interview inshallah taala i'll see you in another exciting episode of sky is the limit till then allah hafiz